explosive billiard balls. In 1870, during the heyday of the Old West, the proprietor of a pool parlour in a Colorado mining camp sent to J.W. Hyatt of Albany, New York, for a supply of his new patent composition billiard balls. Described as cheaper and more durable than ivory, the balls seemed ideal for Colorado. They possessed qualities not mentioned in the advertisement. Soon Hyatt discovered that when a patent ball came into contact with the end of a cigar, it burst into flames. Also, a vigorous cannon was liable to produce a minor explosion. Although he had not anticipated that his products would create such alarming phenomena, Mr. Hyatt, of the Albany Billiard Ball Company, knew the reason. Originally a printer by trade, and with no training in chemistry, he had spent years searching for a method of making artificial ivory. He discovered that an easily moulded plastic material could be made from nitrocellulose, commonly called gun cotton. To make the gun cotton plastic so it could be moulded into billiard balls, Hyatt dissolved it in alcohol and mixed it with camphor. No longer as hazardous as in its original state, the gun cotton yet remained extremely inflammable. The outer casing of the balls, which carried the colouring matter, and a greater amount of gun cotton than the interior, was unstable enough to detonate at a sharp concussion. Fortunately for billiard enthusiasts, it was now possible to produce balls less lethal than those which unnerved the miners of Colorado over a century ago. Plastics bearing various trade names superseded elephant tusk so long ago that it would be hard to find a set of ivory billiard or snooker balls today. Originally, synthetic ivory billiard balls were made from an early form of celluloid or xylonite. Although such natural plastics as gutta perca, pitch, amber, resin, wax, gelatin, glue and shellac have been in use for hundreds of years, technicians had always sought a better material. They wanted something which could be cheaply manufactured in any quantity, moulded into any shape, rendered as hard as metal or as pliable as leather. In addition, it must be proofed against heat, cold, moisture or chemicals. Progress in this direction was reported as far back as 1862 when visitors to the Great International Exhibition in London were intrigued by the display of an entirely new substance called Parkazine. According to the inventor, Alexander Parks of Birmingham, Parkasin could be produced more cheaply than gutta perca. Its possibilities seemed unlimited, since it could be cast, stamped, dyed, stained or carved. Although Parks had practically no technical training, he was well known for inventions connected with electric metallurgy, alloys and rubberized clothing. He was present when Christian Frederick Schoenheim, the German inventor of gun cotton, gave a demonstration at Woolwich Arsenal. The explosive quantities of nitrocellulose did not interest Parks, but he was impressed when Schoenburn dissolved it in alcohol to form collodion, later used as a base for photographic film and as an artificial skin to protect wounds. The speed with which collodion coagulated gave Parks the idea that some kind of plastic material could be made from it. After many experiments, he tried mixing it with camphor. The result was the world's first man-made plastic, Parkazine, which aroused so much interest at the exhibition of 1862 that the inventor formed a manufacturing company. Its first products were combs, cameos, knife handles, brooches and rollers for spinning and weaving. The enterprise was not a success because, it was asserted, Park's anxiety to keep down costs resulted in substandard products. The business fell into the hands of Dr. Daniel Spell, who improved the product and renamed it Xylonite. Spell carried on for a few years, only to become involved in a lawsuit against the American Hyatt, whose cellulose, he alleged, infringed Park's original patents. Suing in an American court is both leisurely and costly, and the case of Parks v. Hyatt dragged on for years. At one stage, Spell was awarded $750,000 damages. Hyatt appealed. By the time the appeal reached the higher court, the original trial judge had been promoted. In his new capacity as appeal judge, he reversed his own decision and dismissed the case. Dr. Spell abandoned the struggle and died. His company survived the blow to grow into the powerful British Xylonite company of today. The wide popularity of celluloid was primarily due to its use in combs and collars. Before this, combs were expensive articles of wood or tortoise shell. The new cheap celluloid combs sold in millions. 
Equally profitable was the celluloid collar, an inexpensive substitute for the high-starched white linen which every gentleman was expected to enclose his throat. The celluloid collar scarcely stood up to close inspection, but it could be laundered with a rub with a damp cloth and enabled countless citizens to maintain their status at a minimum cost. Although hard, easily moulded and of great tensile strength, celluloid was too inflammable to be the ideal plastic. It will even burn under water. Many people regarded it as more dangerous than gun cotton from which it originated. When it came to be used for photographic and cinema film, anti-celluloid prejudice was reinforced by some catastrophic fires in theatres and film processing plants. In recent years, dangerous nitrocellulose film has been replaced by slow-burning nitroacetate. One of the byproducts of this film was rayon. The end of World War I caught the firm of Dreyfus Brothers of Newark. They had been manufacturing non-inflammable photographic film for the U.S. War Department, but in November 1918, the armistice left them with an enormous stock of cellulose acetate on their hands. While experimenting to find a profitable use for it, they evolved a new synthetic fibre and eventually grew into the Selenese Corporation, one of the world's largest manufacturers of rayon. One of the humbler characters in the story of plastics was the cat owned by the Bavarian savant Adolf Spitteler of Prienne. As well as keeping its master's laboratory free from mice, the cat capsized a bottle of formaldehyde solution into its saucer of milk. The result was a junket-like substance from which stemmed the plastics of the casein family, principally used in the manufacture of buttons. The decline of the trochus shell fishing industry on the north coast of Australia can be traced to Spittler's cat. Spittler's experiments were followed by Dr. Leo Hendrik Bakerland, a Belgian. He migrated to America in 1889. From manufacturing photographic printing papers of his own invention, Bakerland developed into one of the most notable figures in the history of plastics. During the early years of the century, he discovered that the reaction of phenol and formaldehyde produced a synthetic resin which he called Bakelite. From Bakerland's work came the great variety of cast phenolic resins. The world has known few substances more useful than the phenolic resin produced by varying processes and bearing innumerable names. It is non-absorbent, non-inflammable, tasteless, colourless and odourless. It resists acids, alkalis and oils, hardens with age and does not conduct electricity. Although nylon stockings were unknown until World War II, the notion of spinning a synthetic thread like a silkworm long intrigued scientists. The first to do so was the Frenchman Count Hildère de Chardonnet, who produced an artificial silk by forcing a solution of nitrocellulose through a tiny orifice. Hardening as swiftly as the web spun by a spider, the thread was the world's first synthetic fibre, but the fabric woven from it was highly inflammable. Chardonnet did his best to render it fireproof, but merely reduced its strength and made it so absorbent that it always felt damp. Later investigators improved it, but it was not until 1939 that the American chemist Wallace Carothers produced the first nylon. Since then, innumerable synthetic fabrics have been produced. Most have been given trade names. Their scientific names would make shopping difficult. When Bakerland first produced the plastic, which was named after him, he suggested it would be found useful in 27 industrial processes. Whether the end product is an aeroplane or a contact lens, a shirt or a ship, Mulder's muck, as the original Parkazine was derisively called, comes into it somewhere.